This is a step-by-step -step example of how to prepare a basic ASC 740 tax provision. Before getting into the details, I'm showing you on screen the background and assumptions for the sample company in this example. Now I'm not going to go over these items in detail, but you may find it helpful to pause the video and read through them before we go any further. Now that you understand this company's profile, the situation is this. Year one has ended, and it's early to mid-January of year two, and you've been tasked with preparing the company's tax provision. You can't do any meaningful work on the tax provision until you have information on the company's income, expenses, assets, and liabilities. So with this in mind, your first step is to obtain the latest trial balance of the company from the accounting group. Now, if the final trial balance isn't quite ready, that's okay. Take whatever the accounting group can give you right away so that you can start the tax provision process and then you can update your work later on once the trial balance is final. The unadjusted opening trial balance for this example is found in work paper 1600 of our Excel workbook. And what do I mean by unadjusted opening trial balance? Didn't we just say that we were looking to get the final trial balance from the accounting group? What I mean by the unadjusted trial balance is that the figures in this sample trial balance are final except for the tax-related figures. Calculating and supporting the tax-related amounts for the final trial balance is your job, and it's one of the main purposes of preparing the tax provision work papers. With the trial balance in hand, let's examine it more closely. In this format, debits are positive and credits are negative. That being the case, you'll see that the trial balance foots to zero, which means that total assets are equal to liabilities plus shareholders' equity. This should always be the case, and if it's not, immediately contact the accounting group for clarification. You'll also notice looking through the accounts that I've kept this trial balance as simple as possible so that it's easier to zero in on the tax provision related concepts that I'm trying to emphasize. With an overall understanding of the trial balance, the next step is to compute pre-tax book income. There are a couple of different ways to think about this computation and both get you to the same answer. Option one is to calculate pre-tax book income by summing all income and expense accounts on the trial balance except for income tax related expenses. Option two is to sum all income and expense items to calculate net income and then you add back income tax expenses to arrive at pre-tax book income. I recommend calculating pre-tax book income using both methods to ensure that you get the same answer, especially if you're unfamiliar with a particular company's trial balance. And while that may sound like overkill, getting pre-tax book income right is vital because it's the starting point for the tax provision calculation. After you've confirmed pre-tax book income, you're ready to start computing the tax provision itself. What follows is a review of tax provision mechanics. We just learned that pre-tax book income is the starting point of the tax provision calculation. As a result, you'll see that the $125,000 we just proved out is at the top of our tax provision work paper. Pre-tax book income is determined pursuant to the rules of U.S. GAAP. If there were no differences between GAAP and the tax rules, pre-tax book income would equal taxable income. However, for the tax provision computation, you have to examine income, expense, and balance sheet accounts in the trial balance to determine if any amount should be modified based on the rules of the Internal Revenue Code and the accompanying regulations to arrive at taxable income. If there are differences between how an item of income or expense is calculated for GAAP versus tax purposes, it's referred to as a book tax difference. Depreciation is an example that's almost always computed one way for book or GAAP purposes and another way for tax purposes. Also, book tax differences are further subdivided between permanent and temporary differences. In this simplified example, we're going to assume that there are no book tax differences, which also means there are no permanent or temporary differences. At this point, it's important to understand that the tax expense of a company for ASC 740 purposes is a gap concept, 
not a tax return concept. And with that in mind, it's important to break the company's tax expense into two components. The first is the current tax expense, and the second is the deferred tax expense. Together, current taxes plus deferred taxes equal the company's total tax expense, which is also referred to as its total tax provision. Let's now focus on the first component, computing the current tax expense of the company. For now, and this is definitely a simplified assumption, think of the current tax expense as the cash tax due when the company files its tax return. As another simplification, we'll say that this company hasn't made any estimated tax or extension payments, and then it will settle its entire tax expense when it files its tax return for year one, when it's due later in year two. Finally, we're not going to deal with state taxes separately in this example. Instead, we're going to use a combined federal and state rate of 25%. Based on these factors, the current tax expense of the company is $31,250, which is $125,000 of pre-tax book income times a tax rate of 25%. The next step in the tax provision process would be to compute the deferred tax expense for the company. However, in this simplified example, we're going to assume that the deferred taxes are zero. So to sum all of that up, the company's total tax expense or provision is $31,250, which is equal to a current tax expense of $31,250 plus deferred taxes of zero. After you calculate the total tax expense of the company, it's tempting to think that you're done, but you've still got a long way to go. It's critical to understand that one of the main purposes of the tax provision is to calculate the tax adjusting journal entry or the tax AJE necessary to close the books on the accounting period and to provide it to the company's accounting group. Think of it this way. ASC 740 is also known as tax accounting. And what kind of accounting or journal entries have you done up to this point? The answer is none. You haven't done any accounting. All you've done so far is to use the company's trial balance to compute the tax provision. But the numbers from your tax provision, even if they're correct, don't magically leap into your company's accounting system. You're the one who makes that happen. And how do you do that? To further illustrate this point, let's look at work paper 50, the tax journal entry summary. On the far left, we see a list of income tax accounts from the trial balance, which come from the general ledger, or GL, of the company. In the opening balance column, we see amounts coming from the GL that tie to our unadjusted trial balance, or the trial balance as it stands right now without taking any tax entries into account. In the middle column, we see calculated balances, or what the tax balances of the various accounts should be based on our tax provision work papers. The final column is our tax adjusting entry, or the debits and credits the accounting group will book to finalize the GL and the trial balance. And again, this final column is the difference between what the tax accounts are right now in the GL versus what they should be. In summary, based on our tax provision work, this is the work paper that will provide the accounting group so that they can make the tax entry, and it's also what they'll rely on as support for doing so. Now it's important to keep in mind that thus far, we've only proven out one side of our tax entry, which is a debit to current tax expense of $31,250. But where does the support come from for the credit of $31,250 to our taxes payable? The answer is that it comes from Work Paper 60, the Tax Payable Roll Forward. Conceptually, this work paper is a record of income taxes due to or tax refunds due from tax authorities as you progress through the year. Here we see that we started the year with an opening taxes payable balance of zero. As noted in the assumptions, we made no estimated tax or extension payments as we went through the year. And finally, in preparing the tax provision, we determined that the current tax expense, 
or the cash tax we would owe when we filed our year one return was 31250 Thus, when you add all of those items together, we have an ending taxes payable balance of 31250 And this is what supports the taxes payable line items in our tax adjusting entry on work paper 50. Again, we see the opening balance for taxes payable is zero and that amount ties to our opening unadjusted trial balance. And we've calculated on our taxes payable roll forward work paper that the ending balance for this account should be 31,250. Thus, the adjusting entry for taxes payable is the difference between what the GL balance is now versus what it should be based on our work papers or 31,250. To recap, after you complete the tax adjusting entry, you'll provide a copy, meaning a copy of work paper 50 to the accounting group. They'll then book it, meaning they'll enter the debits and credits you provided into the general ledger. After they do so, the books will be closed and the accounting group will produce a final trial balance. And that's what will be used as the basis for the figures reported in the company's financial statements. Before we go on to the financial statements, let's revisit the trial balance work paper 1600 to solidify your understanding of the unadjusted opening trial balance and the closing or final trial balance. Recall that the unadjusted opening trial balance represented the final trial balance you received from the accounting group for all GL accounts except for the income tax related accounts. After completing the tax provision work papers, we use them to develop the tax adjusting entry, which is represented by the amounts in the middle column. After booking the tax entry, the accounting group closed the books and produced the final trial balance, and this is represented by the last column. And it's these amounts that serve as the basis for the figures reported in the company's financial statements. As a parting thought, as you're going through the tax provision process, it's vitally important not to treat the tax journal entry as an afterthought. Developing and then balancing the tax AJE can be one of the most complex, elusive, and time-consuming elements of preparing the tax provision. Before we go through the tax-related elements of the company's financial statements, I want to make an important point. It doesn't matter if you have great tax return work papers if you don't actually file a return. Do you get what I'm saying? The tax return is the final product, not the supporting work papers. Similarly, the primary purpose of the tax provision work paper package, everything we've done up to this point, is to support the tax related figures and explanations in the company's financial statements, or the 10K, including footnote disclosures, and any related management discussion and analysis. That's the job. So no matter how clean, correct, well-referenced, well-organized, or whatever the tax provision work papers are, if anything tax-related in the financial statements is wrong, then you will have failed to deliver. With that as background, let's see how the various aspects of our tax provision work paper package tie into the financial statements. And we'll start with the balance sheet. Notice there are no tax-related items on the asset side of the balance sheet, but on the liability side, we have a taxes payable of 31250 Recall that we calculated this figure in the taxes payable roll forward at work paper 60. And this amount also ties back to our final trial balance at work paper 1600. Let's now go to the income statement. Here we see a line item, Income Loss Before Income Tax Provision. That's just another name or a long way of saying pre-tax book income. And that amount ties to the pre-tax book income we computed using options 1 and 2 on trial balance work paper 1600. And finally, it also ties to the starting point of our tax provision calculation on work paper 1000. Now take note of the line item Income Tax Provision Benefit, where the amount is $31,250. This is also known as the Total Tax Provision. 
and the support for this amount comes from our tax provision work paper 1000. Remember, this 31250 isn't a tax return only amount, but rather it's an ASC 740 tax accounting concept. And more specifically, it's the sum of both current and deferred taxes, which is something that's made clear by the table at the bottom of the tax provision work paper. In addition to appearing on the face of the financial statements, tax-related items also figure prominently in a company's financial statement footnotes and disclosures. In this simple and abbreviated tax disclosure, we see the presentation of the total tax provision of $31,250, and it's broken down in two ways. First, we see that current and deferred taxes are shown separately, and within each of those categories, there's a further breakdown between federal and state taxes. While I didn't introduce either state taxes or deferred taxes in this simplified example, this footnote disclosure is an important reminder that they both need to be taken into account in the tax provision preparation process. Below the breakdown of the tax provision is a placeholder for the related financial statement footnote. While the CEO and the CFO have overall responsibility for the financial statements, they'll almost always look to you as the tax specialist to draft a tax footnote. Here you're charged with providing a summary of the company's tax profile and positions in language that financial statement readers can understand. It's also important to recognize that you're not winging it. Every sentence you write and every figure within a sentence is subject to audit and therefore must be supported by your tax provision work papers. Now we'll review the section of the tax disclosures known as the Effective Tax Rate Reconciliation. The Effective Tax Rate, or ETR, is the percentage of income tax a company pays on its pre-tax book income. On the first line of the ETR reconciliation, we see $31,250 and 25%. Interpreting this, the $31,250 is the expected tax expense of the company, which is calculated by multiplying its pre-tax book income of $125,000 times its statutory rate, which for our example is the combined federal and state rate of 25%. Skipping to the last line of the ETR reconciliation, this is the actual tax expense of the company divided by its pre-tax book income. The line items in between show what adjustments drive any difference between the company's expected tax at the statutory rate versus its actual tax expense as shown previously. The support for the figures in the effective tax rate reconciliation come from the Tax Provision Work Paper 1000. Specifically, the first line of the ETR reconciliation comes from the pre-tax book income line. And the last line of the ETR reconciliation comes from the section Summary of Current and Deferred Taxes at the bottom of the page. Now that you've verified the tax-related figures on the face of the financial statements, written the tax footnote, and confirmed that everything ties back to the tax provision work papers, you're now ready from a tax perspective for the accounting group to finalize the financial statements. At this point, you might think you have to be done, but there are still actually a few more steps. And you might ask, how is that possible? I mean, how much further down the rabbit hole can this go? The answer is that despite the work that's been done to this point, the financial statements won't be issued by the company until the financial statement auditors are satisfied that everything is in order. And as part of that process, you'll provide the auditors with the tax provision work papers, answer their questions, and provide any other support and explanations they need in order to issue their opinion. And as if all of that wasn't enough, in addition to making sure the tax provision is materially correct, the audit team will also determine if your internal or SOX controls are adequate. What that means is they'll evaluate the tax provision processes that you have in place to determine if they were sufficiently robust to prevent a material misstatement of income tax related items in the financial statements. And they'll also render an opinion on whether you adequately followed those procedures. Finally, 
finally, finally, finally, after all of that, the company completes the financial statements, the auditors issue their opinion, and the financial statements are formally released. Now you have to be done, right? Assuming your financial statements are materially correct, the answer is yes. But if a material tax related or other error is discovered after the financial statements have been issued, it will result in what's referred to as a restatement. In other words, the company will have to reissue corrected financial statements along with an explanation of what happened, why it happened, what changed, and by how much. This is a very big deal and not in a good way, so you want to avoid a restatement if at all possible. And finally, after all of that, you're done. If you found this video to be helpful, you might also benefit from my book, The Missing Tax Accounting Guide, a plain English introduction to ASC 740 tax provisions. Why is the term missing guide in the title? While the tax accounting manuals produced by the large firms are excellent resources on technical points related to ASC 740, they largely assume readers already have a working knowledge of the fundamental mechanics of how tax provisions work. My book makes no such assumptions. I start with basic concepts such as what we've just covered, and from there I continually layer on additional concepts and material to progressively build your understanding permanent differences, temporary differences, deferred taxes, the basics of how to audit tax provisions, and so on. To receive notifications for continuing professional education related to tax accounting, refer to the mailing list sign up on my website. Finally, if you found this video to be helpful, please like it, recommend it to others who might benefit, and consider subscribing to my channel by clicking on my profile picture in the screen that follows. Thank you for watching.